But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, The men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God has exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rode up, rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined them. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. This is God's word. You may be seated. That was a long stander. Pastors and preachers in jail for obeying God. I remember as a, key, as a kid reading stories like this. And even up until recent years, it was difficult for me to imagine what it would be like uh, to live in those kinds of conditions. And imagine the fact that in the past and in many places of the world, Christians today are outlawed or have been outlawed, imprisoned, or sanctioned by the state for obeying the word of God. I don't think it's that hard to imagine anymore, though. But the reality is that this kind of opposition to the church has been going on with varying degrees ever since the very first disciples of Jesus. Indeed, Jesus told his disciples this, listen, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. 
but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Those are the words of Jesus. Those who belong to Jesus do not belong to the world anymore. Surely we are in the world, but we do not belong to the world. And the world loves its own. But the disciples of Jesus buck up against the world and are hated by it because they bear witness to a different Lord than the idols and lords of the world. And this opposition, opposition takes various forms and has taken various forms throughout church history. The early church was considered an enemy of the Roman state, not because they worshipped Jesus. They were considered an enemy of the Roman state because they worshipped Jesus exclusively. They would have loved to let these Christians keep on doing their thing so long as they put Jesus on the shelf with all the other Roman gods. But Jesus will only be worshipped exclusively. The science broadly accepted during the time of Rome declared that neglecting to worship the Roman gods would result in natural disasters. Listen to how the ancient church father Tertullian talks about this. It's not often you get a quote Tertullian. They think the Christians the cause of every public disaster of every affliction with which the people are visited. If the Tiber rises as high as the city walls, if the Nile does not send its water up over the fields, if the heavens give no rain, if there is an earthquake, if there's famine or pestilence, straightway the cry is, away with the Christians to the lions. They were blamed because it was believed, honestly believed, that their exclusive worship of Jesus was a threat. A threat to what? To the common good. And this happens again and again throughout history. This is the old play that the devil loves to play. Christians were criminalized in the Soviet Union and sent to the gulags. Why? Because the social science of the day declared it was for the common good that anyone who proclaimed an authority greater than the state should be purged from the country. Why? For the common good. Christian education today is outlawed in Sweden. And if you attempt to disobey and homeschool your kids, they can take your kids away. Why? Because the social science of the day declares that it is for the common good that children be discipled by the state, not their parents. I just... Just this last week saw a video of a 71-year-old man in London preaching in the public square get arrested. It was April 23rd. Arrested for what? For homophobic speech because he was preaching the lordship of Christ over sexuality while he was preaching the gospel. Why? Because the social science of the day declares that it is for the common good that preaching the full counsel of God be restricted in public places. Just last week, I was able to dial into a phone call, a conference call, and listen to Pastor James Coates, this Canadian pastor, be arraigned by the Crown Prosecutor of Canada. He was imprisoned for 30 days, and his church was fenced off earlier. And similarly, yesterday, I saw photos of another pastor in Canada being carried off, physically carried off by police. What for? For gathering as a church to worship and declare the lordship of Christ over all of life, even life during COVID-19. We should not be surprised that where the gospel is obediently preached with boldness and where the church gathers to worship the Lord who is Lord over all, 
that there are two responses you will see. You will either see conversion or you will see conflict. And that's exactly what we see in the book of Acts. We've seen stories of the conversion of multitudes repenting and being added to the number of believers. But we also see what? Conflict with religious authorities, conflict with political authorities, conflict with Jews, conflict with Gentiles, conflict with merchants, conflict with governors and kings. And yet, the apostles and the Christians displayed a stalwart and joyful, joyful obedience to declare the lordship of Christ, even when it meant their disobedience was punished by beatings, imprisonment, and even martyrdom. Why did they do it? Listen, some of you guys would love to do that just because you don't like the governor telling you what to do. Some of you have an inclination towards civil disobedience. The moment the governor opens his mouth, you say, you can't tell me what to do. That's not what the Bible celebrates. It's not. God commands us in his word to give honor and submit where it is due. It is possible to be motivated by a kind of righteous anger And where the government oversteps its God-given jurisdiction, there is indeed a place for righteous anger. But in this text, in this passage, do you see any righteous anger? It's actually really hard to tell if there is any. If there is any righteous anger anywhere in this passage, it is utterly eclipsed by a deeper and more profound motivation. What was it? The apostles were willing to disobey the authorities, go to jail, do it again, then get beat up for it. Why? Because they knew Jesus. And they treasured the name of Jesus above everything else. That's what gets them into trouble with the authorities in our passage. And they rejoiced. They rejoiced. They were were considered worthy to suffer for the name. And Jesus turned their suffering into rejoicing by his name. How in the world could that be? The name of Jesus is not some magical word or something. Actually, it's far more profound and powerful than that. Knowing the name of Jesus means knowing Jesus himself. Do you know the name of Jesus like they did? Do you know Jesus like they knew Jesus? Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good, so good you'd go to jail for it? So good you'd get beat up and rejoice? Do you know Jesus like that? As you consider those questions, I want to look at our passage and see three things, three things that the name of Jesus does, three things that it does. First, the name of Jesus exposes conflict. Second, the name of Jesus brings life and obedience. And third, the name of Jesus triumphs over opposition. First, the name of Jesus exposes conflict. The context for this trial, this arrest, is super important. This conflict actually was initiated back in Acts chapter 3, when Peter heals a man who was lame, and then it causes this stir in the temple grounds, and, the, and, the, and the, these same leaders call Peter to him to just make a case for what's going on. Here you're teaching this name of Jesus, and Peter uses this moment, he uses this moment in front of these authorities. And don't get hung up on the fact that these were high priests and council members. This is the Senate of Israel. This is the mayors. This is the county commissioners. Don't read into the passage a separation of church and state. When they were questioned by these guys, what does Peter do? He draws all of his attention to the name of Jesus. Listen to what he says. 
Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel but that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. By revealing that it was the name of Jesus that healed the lame man, Peter also did something. Did you notice that? He exposed the sin of the high priest and the authorities of the temple for their role in rejecting and crucifying Jesus. And they don't like that. They don't like having their sin exposed, and they refuse to submit to the name of Jesus, so they used their authority to threaten them and charge them with no longer teaching the name of Jesus. So what is an apostle to do? What do they do? After this first act, of, first act in a three-part act of intimidation, They prayed for boldness. Boldness for what? To continue preaching the name of Jesus. Do you ever pray for boldness? Pray for boldness in a conversation with a friend? Pray for boldness? You should. But that doesn't stop them. It doesn't stopping. Stopping is not even a question for them. Why? Because of who Jesus is. So you have to ask the question, who is Jesus? Jesus is the ultimate of ultimate priorities. He is the Lord of glory. He is the maker of all things. He is the upholder of the universe. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the author of life. It is this Jesus who is so, so, so worthy of all your praise, all your life, all of your breaths. It is this Jesus who they, the apostles, witnessed going to Calvary so that by his shed blood on the cross, he might purchase rebels, sinners like you and me. Why? To rescue them from death, to rescue them from hell in their rebellion. And it is this Jesus who rose from the grave and who was given all authority on heaven and earth, and he now, the apostles knew this, he now sits at the right hand of the Father, and he rules over all. There is no one like him. There is no one like this Jesus. If you just taste, you will see he is good. They saw every square inch of human existence as belonging to Jesus. And so you know what they did? They named him wherever they went. And they started with Jerusalem and the temple. That's why Acts starts there. Threats could not hinder them. When they were told, first, to no longer teach the name of Jesus, do you know what they didn't do? They didn't cede any territory They didn't decide that the message of Jesus was only for their homes, and they didn't soften their message by removing the name of Jesus, and they didn't move to a different spot of town where they might not offend the authorities. The first time they're busted for this, they're teaching in Solomon's portico. Do you know where they're busted now? They were just earlier in Acts 5. Where were they? Solomon's portico again. What were they doing? The exact same thing. We miss that context sometimes. And honestly, if you just take the truth serum for a second, like John's been mentioning the last couple of weeks, you probably can't help but think, isn't that kind of rude to go back to the same place the authorities just told you not to go to? I mean, why didn't they go somewhere else and keep doing the thing? They could have done the same thing somewhere else, right? Why did they go back to the exact same spot? 
Why did they do exactly what they were not told to do? It's kind of like they were poking the bear. Are we really surprised they got arrested? Are you surprised they got arrested when they went, they, they did the thing they said not to do. They got threats. They went back to the exact same place they got arrested. Is this like some sort of negative publicity stunt? And it was a public scene. It says that they were arrested and put in public prison, but the word probably means they were arrested publicly, meaning they made a scene. Can you just imagine? I mean, it's not that hard to do. Can you imagine if this happened today? How many Christians would publish open letters and blogs saying, we would like to apologize on behalf of Peter and the apostles? They were incredibly insensitive by going to the exact same spot. They were incredibly insensitive for not changing gears. We just want you to know they don't represent us. I can hear them asking, does Peter have some sort of persecution complex? Is he some sort of like masochist to go to the same spot? And also, doesn't Romans 13 say to be subject to the ruling authorities? Shouldn't he have avoided conflict with the rulers? Wouldn't it have been more strategic to change gears? He could have started an online ministry. If he wanted, God could have corrected Peter right then and there, if he wanted to. But do you know what he does instead? He busts him out of jail. He busts him out of jail, and he sends an angel. And you know what the angel says to do? He says, do it again. He says, go back to where? To the temple. He says, don't. He doesn't say, go across town, start something different, keep it in the homes. He says, go back to the temple and tell them all the words of life. Listen, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And so, of course, they do it again. Why? Because knowing the name of Jesus means knowing that he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Because knowing the name of Jesus means knowing him who has all authority over every jurisdiction. And that when our governing authorities command us to disobey or restrict us from obeying God, we must obey God rather than men. There's no question. Because knowing the name of Jesus means knowing he is worthy of being praised as Lord in every place. Knowing the name of Jesus means knowing he owns everything. He owns everyone, and he calls them graciously to come to him. And when he does it, he uses his name. Listen, when the name of Jesus is proclaimed and taught, it's not that it produces conflict. It doesn't produce conflict. Rather, it reveals conflict. And it exposes a conflict that is already there. Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. There is no neutrality with Jesus. You are either for him or you are against him. When his name is proclaimed, that is the conflict that is exposed. We are told the reason they put him in jail was because they were Jealous. Why were they jealous? What were they jealous of? They were jealous because they saw Jesus as he was. Jesus is the real high priest. Jesus is the real authority. He's the good king of kings. And they saw him as intruding upon their authority. But Jesus is never, ever an intruder. He's never an intruder. Those opposed to him are the real intruders. In our sin, in my sin, I'm the intruder. In your sin, you are the intruder. We are rebels. 
He owns the world. He owns our bodies. He owns our life. He is the standard of beauty and goodness. He is the holy king of kings and lord of lords, but we rebel against this holy God. This is why Ephesians says that by nature we are children of wrath. And that is exactly why, it's exactly why the name of Jesus must be declared everywhere. Which brings me to my next point. The name of Jesus brings life and obedience. When the rulers realize that the apostles escaped prison and they're once again exactly where they're not supposed to be in the temple teaching, preaching Jesus, they confront them again. But listen to what they say. It's, it's very revealing. The high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. The high priest accuses the apostles of attempting to bring the blood of Jesus upon them. Now, what they mean is that you're attempting to judge us and condemn us for crucifying him, for being participating in his death, but they've got it completely wrong. By preaching the name of Jesus, yes, yes, they were attempting to bring the blood of Jesus upon them, but not in the way they think. The blood of Jesus cries much better words than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus cries from the grave, I forgive you. I bring you life. Listen to Peter's response. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Do you hear what Peter is saying? In this confrontation, he makes it abundantly clear that though they killed Jesus, God exalted him in order to grant repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Is it a sin to kill Jesus? Yes, they have here in the name of Jesus the, the forgiveness of sins being preached to them. And what did they do? They reject it. The name of Jesus is always preached so that Jesus, Jesus himself, can give repentance and forgiveness. The only way that the forgiveness comes is through the blood of Jesus, and the name of Jesus graciously exposes our sins so that we might be saved from death and given life. And that's why when the angel says, go and teach them again, he refers to their words as, teach them all the words of this life. This is why Jesus came. Listen to John 3. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the son of God. And this is the judgment, the light has come into the world, and the people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. When the light exposes the darkness of sin, the darkness of our sin, your sin, you will either respond in belief in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, or we will recoil from the light because we love the darkness and we love our rebellion against God more. It is only by a miracle of the Spirit acting through the word of God preached that our hearts are changed to love the light of Jesus and to turn from darkness. And it is a miracle. It is a miracle of grace. Have you tasted that grace? It's a miracle brought 
of bringing life to you by the name of Jesus, whose blood was shed for sinners. This means knowing the name of Jesus means knowing he is not apathetic about even your smallest and most respectable sins. In fact, your sin, even the one you think is the smallest, is so devastating that in order to save you from it, he shed his blood for you on the cross. Knowing the name of Jesus means knowing that while you were an enemy of God in gracious and holy love, Jesus died and bore the punishment of your sin in order to free you from the slavery of it. The slavery of sin. He came to free you from it, including the slavery that you have to the fear of man, including the slavery you have to drunkenness, including the slavery you have to envy and covetousness, including the slavery you have to bitterness, including the slavery you have to pride, including the slavery you have to pornography, including the slavery you have to adultery, homosexuality, transgenderism, all of them, all the slaveries, he came to free you from it. Knowing the name of Jesus means knowing he frees you He frees you from the slavery and death of sin in order that you might be free to walk in joyful obedience to him. Joyful obedience. You know where the joy is? It's not in any of those things. It's in knowing the name of Jesus. Do you know it? Do you know his name? Peter says he must obey God rather than men. This is the kind of person that the name of Jesus produces. They were freed, freed from sin and fear and disobedience in order to walk in obedience to God, no matter the threats. The worthiness of the name of Jesus transformed their beatings and sufferings into something worth rejoicing in. Can you imagine the laughter and the rejoicing after getting beat up? The singing of songs, walking down the road while you're wicking your wounds? What does that? The name of Jesus does that. This is what happens when small town fishermen obey God rather than men and boldly preach the name of Jesus. And this is how the gospel of the name of Jesus goes forward. Yes, often with trials, often with opposition. The story of church history is one huge story of a series of triumphs and victories disguised as defeats. Which brings me to my last point, the name of Jesus triumphs over opposition. As I said earlier, sadly, the council and the senate, sadly, they reject Jesus. They see him as an intruder, and rather than bow to him and his lordship, it says that they were enraged and wanted to kill the apostles. But then there rose up among them someone named Gamaliel. You know what Gamaliel said? He said, calm down, listen, there have been movements like this before. Remember Theodos? Remember Judas the Galilean? When each one of them died, eventually all of their followers just scattered and the whole thing just was snuffed out. And then he says something incredibly telling, something that could, should give the church incredible courage and hope. He says this, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. This is one of those moments where somebody who doesn't even realize it is speaking prophetically and speaking a profound truth. Gamaliel says that if Jesus, if he's like Theodos, if he's like Judas who died, this whole Jesus thing is just gonna turn to nothing. Listen, the bones, 
of Theodos, the bones of Judas the Galilean are still in some obscure, dirty place in Palestine. Where are the bones of Jesus? He rose again, and he is now at the right hand of his father. And what is he doing? He's ruling. Death could not hold Jesus. And Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail over his church. Do you know why? Because they didn't prevail over Jesus. They didn't prevail over him. Philippians tells us that he, is, he has been exalted God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus is ruling and victory belongs to him. Every tongue will confess. Every tongue will confess he is Lord. And he is at the right hand of the Father. You know what he's doing? He's interceding for you. He's praying for his church. Do you think his prayers will go unanswered? Do you think the prayers of Jesus fall on deaf God the Father ears? No way. No way. God will hear his prayers. He prays for you. Like Gamaliel said, if this undertaking is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found to be opposing God if you try. God is behind us. Knowing the name of Jesus means knowing that you can trust him and that for those who love God and treasure the name of Jesus, all things work together for good. Knowing the name of Jesus means knowing that you can walk faithfully and courageously and even suffer because you know that in Christ, victory is often disguised as defeat. Knowing the name of Jesus means knowing that he loves to save and and rescue sinners and surprise us. He loves to surprise us by making stony hearts come alive to see the glory of his name. We read in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Pastors, preachers, Christians, the church who proclaim and gather in his name and sing his name. When we do that, God, by grace, saves sinners by calling them to his name. If you know this Jesus, if you believe in this Jesus, if you know the sweetness of the forgiveness of sins, do you know why? It's because he hasn't stopped doing it. He is still saving sinners. Today, you are proof he hasn't stopped doing it, and he will keep doing it. He will for the glory of his name. For there is salvation in no one else, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we are so encouraged by the strength, the strong name of Jesus we're so encouraged by the sweetness of knowing his name. We're so encouraged that though he exposes our sin, he does not leave us exposed, but bears them so that our sins could be exposed and killed in the cross in his body and that he rises again. He rose for us so that we could know new life and obedience, joyful obedience and living apart from the slavery that used to enslave us so badly. God, keep doing it. Keep making stony hearts alive. Keep pressing the name of Jesus into everywhere in this world where it is not treasured or hallowed. Keep that word going out. Keep it manifesting in our hearts when we are tempted to turn stony. God, we pray this in your name. Would you do it? Amen.